Uh, good morning, dear audience and our distinguished guests. Uh, welcome to DAKE, Turkey Denmark Business Council EU Talks, which the topic is food security and sustainability in post corona era in Turkey and Denmark. Uh, our audience and uh, our distinguished guests, uh, our plan is to start with my uh, remarks and continuing with uh, General Consul uh, Anet's remarks and uh, with the um, presentation uh, of uh, Aishin Hanum, uh, General Director and Chairperson of Director General of Agricultural Enterprises, continuing with Aicha Akat, Turkey Country Director of CHR Hansen, and Dr. Umut Keroğlu, uh, the Country Director of Turkey of Novozymes and Middle East and Africa Commercial Director. So today the topic is quite challenging. Uh, we have faced and we are now facing a COVID-19 pandemic and the post-COVID uh, era will be uh, to a certain extent uh, much more different than what we are facing up to now. So the food security and sustainability is the topic we will be having our experiences and correspondences you know, by mutual parts and having the experiences on after and projections in after COVID-19 era. So I would like to start with the presentation and a summary of our business consul on Turkey and Denmark. Um, uh, as we know, uh, the Foreign Economic Relations Board of Turkey was established in 1985 and our um, uh, Turkey-Denmark business consul uh, uh, the Turkish side of the business council took its first step in 1992. Me as the chairperson of the uh, Turkish uh, Denmark business council. It was followed by various meetings and seminars organized in Denmark with associations of the country's business community. The business council was officially established in 1999 in the context of the Danish Turkish Cooperation Day organized in Istanbul. And the founding protocol was signed by the Umar Pachin, founding chairperson of the council, and Svend Henriksen, deputy CEO of the Confederation of Danish Industry. The council's activities are focused on the sectors of energy, contracting, biotechnology, furniture, textiles, with Danish companies contributing technical information, expertise, design work, R&D capacities, and technological know-how to partnership, and the Turkish side bringing in labor, logistical advantages, manufacturing cap capacities, and production experiences. Besides providing a platform for productive partnerships, the Council also works on the promotion of the green economy concept in industry, agriculture, and the construction sector. The Business Council devotes activities both to large corporations and to small and medium-sized enterprises. And presenting the Danish technology and experience to its partners in Turkey in the sectors of renewable energy, localized heating, energy efficiency, biotechnology, agriculture, and animal husbandry, on which Denmark is a leading country in the world, and also expanding the ongoing cooperation between Turkey and Denmark on textile among the Turkish and Danish small and medium enterprises in the sectors of machinery, manufacturing, building materials, foodstuffs, and durable consumer goods. Our activities of the Council uh, uh, in March 2017, it was a roundtable meeting with the members of the Parliament of Denmark. In September 2017, Mayor Delegation to Tem Denmark on Waste to Energy and District Heating. In March 2018, Denmark country presentation at the Özgün University in Turkey in Istanbul. In uh, 15th of June 2020, uh, it was the day webinar EU talks, which is going to be held today and our future uh, coming activities is the day interconnected business series with Denmark in cooperation with DI and frequent meetings with Danish ambassadors and consul generals to Turkey also Turkish ambassadors to Denmark so after having a brief information about the Turkey Denmark business consul I would like to start with my remarks on the topic which we're going to having discussions and our distinguished panelists uh, correspondences and experiences on this food security and sustainability era. As you, as we all know, due to COVID-19 pandemic, border closures, quarantines, and market supply change and trade disruptions are restricting people's access 
to sufficient and diverse and nutritious sources of food, especially in countries hit hard by the virus or already affected by high levels of food insecurity. Both lives and livelihoods are at risk from this pandemic. Thus, in some countries, the spread of the pandemic has been slowing down and the cases are decreasing. In others, COVID-19 is resurging and continuing to spread quickly. This is still a global problem calling for a global response. In any scenario, the most effective will be the poorest and most vulnerable segments of the population, including migrants, the displaced, and those hit by conflict. Countries in protracted crisis also suffer from underinvestment in public health, which will amplify the pandemic's impacts. Some 820 million people around the world are experiencing hunger, consuming an insufficient amount of calories for a normal active life for a long period. Hunger impacts everyone negatively, but it's particularly damaging on children's growth and development. Its effects are irreversible and carry long-term implications for our future and sustainable development. All we know that the pandemic will eventually retreat, but we still don't know how fast this will happen. We also know that this shock is a somewhat unusual as it affects significant elements of both food supply and demand. The significant slowdown of all economies of the world, and especially of the most vulnerable ones, as unemployment rates have risen and COVID-19's economic impacts will be felt more, will make countries, especially food import dependent countries, struggle to have the needed resources to buy food. In turn, as demand for food will decrease over the next months, prices should be going down in 2020, and thus this will have a negative impact on farmers and agriculture sector sustainability development. As of now, disruptions have been minimal as food supply has been adequate and markets have been stable so far. However, we have already seen challenges in terms of logistic bottlenecks, not being able to move food from A point to point B, which have by mid-May largely resolved and likely there is less food of high value commodities, including example fruits and vegetables being brought to market. As of June, we still expect disruptions in the food supply chains, especially in the high value commodities, meat, fish, milk, fruits and vegetables, and the restrictions of movements as well as a basic aversion behavior by workers may impede farmers from farming and food processors who handle the vast majority of agricultural products from processing. Shortage of fertilizers, Veterinary medicine, medicines and other input could affect agricultural production also. Closures of restaurants and less frequent grocery shipping diminish demand for fresh produce and fisheries products affecting producers and suppliers. Sectors in agriculture, fisheries and aquaculture are particularly also affected by the restrictions on tourism, closure of restaurants and coffee and school meals suspension. What is also worrying is that at the end of 2019, a further of 183 million people in 55 countries and the territories were found to be exposed to acute food insecurity, not yet a crisis at a crisis level, but outing them at the risk of slipping into crisis levels if faced with a shock or stressor such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, if COVID-19 cases proliferate in countries home to millions of people experiencing acute food insecurity, many of those public health and social protection systems face capacity constraints and the consequences could be drastic. So coming to the topic, we all know that the food security and sustainability issues are much more crucial than ever. So I would like to give the word and the floor to Annette, uh, our general consul of Denmark to Istanbul, and continue with her um, uh, valuable uh, experiences and the comments on the topic uh, by contributing to Denmark's capabilities and experiences on the food security and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma Bray. And let me first. Uh take this opportunity to congratulate once again the new board of the Turkey-Denmark Business Council 
We are uh, delighted to see all of you uh, there and uh, we are looking very much forward to uh, continuing our co cooperation. Of course, it's been a little uh, challenged in the first months due to this uh, corona crisis, but, um, but I'm sure that uh, we will have ample opportunity uh, exploring Danish-Turkish relations during the next uh, coming years that you are in, in the chair. Um, so on, uh, on Denmark and, uh, and the corona crisis, uh, we were hit um, pretty uh, hard in the beginning, uh, but uh, as Turkey, Denmark closed down very effectively and uh, was closed down for a couple of months very effectively, which means that, that now, um, actually it's very parallel to the way it's uh, developed in Turkey because now Denmark is also opening. Uh, all shops and uh, cafes and restaurants and uh, companies are opened and this uh, today actually the civil servants from the, the east part of Denmark are also allowed back in the office which means my colleagues back in the foreign ministry in Copenhagen are now also allowed to go to work in the office in a controlled manner where not everybody will be working uh, at the same time but uh, but recognizing that things are moving in the right direction in Denmark we are seeing less and less uh, infected and we have a very effective test strategy where you with your Danish ID card can go and uh, book an online time I did that myself when I landed in Denmark uh, last week and within uh, two days you have the result uh, so a lot of more people are being tested and uh, the borders open today between Denmark Germany Norway and Iceland. Um, Denmark is still a little bit reluctant to open internally in the EU, not to speak of any uh, third world, uh, third countries uh, outside the EU. Um, so I'm, uh, we're following this very closely because of course it's interesting also in respect of Turkey and our Turkish-Danish uh, relationship. But so far I think we need to probably wait until the end of August until we see a full opening of the Danish borders. There are a lot of exemptions to um, to being able to enter Denmark and business purpose is one of them. So if you can document you have a meeting in Denmark, you can, uh, you can enter Denmark, of course, with the, with the kind of visa that you like. So the, the government has been very uh, good at introducing a lot of serious measures, measures in the beginning and now they're being criticized largely for being too slow at opening again. And I think this is one of the situations where it's so difficult to have an opinion because it is very difficult to know whether uh who to trust and and you know what the, the not even the experts themselves know exactly what is uh going on they have been the, the the medical experts in denmark have been wrong so many times during this corona where they predicted that it would be mass immunity than there wasn't they predicted that people that we would have mu much more uh, infected so it would be uh there would be pressure on the hospitals that didn't happen either so a lot of uh, incidents where they have tried their best to find out what is happening but it just proves to me that this is completely new territory and nobody knows how to maneuver or how to navigate and i think we just have to compliment both the danish and the turkish government for being just in time and actually taking all the relevant measures that should be taken to combat this uh, epidemic so we have a good chance of of getting back on track and uh, and continuing with business uh, in in both of our countries, uh, Denmark um, has introduced to mitigate uh, some of the economic risks here. Uh, Denmark has introduced a large export and investment package to Danish companies, directed pri primarily at Danish SMEs, uh, but also um, at larger Danish companies and. Uh, we have informed all of our Danish companies in Turkey about this uh, and there's actually a, a total of 225 million which is about 30 million euro uh, in, uh, in aid to exporting companies primarily giving them a discount on the services of the Danish Trade Council to promote uh, their services abroad and we are in dialogue with so many Danish companies that were not really interested in Turkey before because they found it maybe too risky or our prices were, were too high where with these new incentives we actually see a renewed interest in the Turkish market which I find very positive uh, and uh, because of course I'm a huge believer in the Turkish market and I'm absolutely sure that the Turkish economy will bounce back as it has done 
time after time. Um, and now, therefore, it's a fantastic opportunity for people to invest in Turkey and to, to invest in building a business in Turkey and building partnerships with Turkish companies. So we are spending a lot of our time um, advising Danish companies on how to do this within the various sectors. Uh, and of course, uh, sustainability is in the forefront of everything we do. I'm sure you all know that Denmark was the first country to announce that we would be CO2 or 70% CO2 neutral by 2030 uh, as, the, as, a, as a, a sort of a pioneer in, uh, in autumn last year. And the Corona crisis to some extent has made it easier because we haven't consumed so much. So for a while uh, it went really well with the, uh, with the emissions. But now, of course, when everything comes back on track, the uh, dialogue becomes even more important on how do we together ensure that uh, we continue the good signs from, uh, from these two months where we haven't consumed so much and how can we introduce much more sustainable technologies how can we, uh, within food security, of course, but also within energy, energy consumption, uh, water consumption, which is also part of the food production sector. So in my mind, all the sectors uh, that can benefit from sustainability and are becoming more sustainable, they are sort of interconnected in a way. If you don't look at the way you, you consume energy in your food production, you're not sustainable, even though you may be organic or you may be using less fertilizer or be looking at other elements of sustainability. You still have to look at, look at your water usage, your, your energy usage and, uh, and how to combine um, the best technologies from Turkey and Denmark in, in achieving the most optimal solutions. And I think that is our task uh, the coming years to, uh, to identify the needs in Turkey and find out uh, where are the Danish innovative solutions that we can help introduce? And with this new package, also there's a huge discount on uh, trade uh, delegations. So we are expecting uh, a, a trade delegation to Turkey next year in Q1, uh, which will be on uh, on energy as a sort of a, and sustainability. Uh, and I I'm looking very much forward to that because this is the first uh, real delegation to Turkey for a while um, due to uh, to the political turbulence uh, in Turkey, we haven't been able to really get any uh, high-level Danish officials to uh, to dare to go to Turkey, even though we are telling them that it's perfectly safe. So, uh, but but there is uh, absolutely a new willingness now from the Danish companies and uh, the Danish industry to visit Turkey. So I'm looking very much forward to that. Um, we have also a new incoming ambassador on 1st September. We will welcome Mr. Dani Anand who is our current ambassador in uh, Iran right now. Uh, and he has a huge appetite for trade. So um, he has instructed me to make sure that I meet everybody relevant within, uh, he meets them uh, within the first month of his, uh, his uh, ambassadorship. So he will be coming to Istanbul and we will be organizing uh, events with him so he can be introduced to the Turkish Danish Business Council, but also of course to Danish companies and to, to the relevant Turkish stakeholders and partners and companies that we are uh, all uh, engaging with. So I'm looking very much forward to that. Uh, I think he will be a, a good uh, follow-up for, for Ambassador Olling, who has done a, a fantastic job in the four years that he was the Danish ambassador. And uh, I'm also looking forward to, um, to uh, uh, you know, re-engaging with the Danish or the Turkish ambassador to, to Denmark, uh, Mr. Kenan Ipek, who's a good friend and introducing him to the Danish ambassador and getting uh, reconnecting on the Danish uh, Turkish business issues that we were actually uh, uh, doing quite well with before this whole uh, Corona crisis turned our lives upside down. My final remarks will just be that uh, sustainability is of course um, in the forefront of everything. And if there's something we have learned from the last uh, couple of months, it's that we all need to contribute, but also that it's possible. You know, from one day to the other, people didn't drive anymore, didn't consume anymore, didn't use so much waste anymore. These kind of, of lessons that we learned because we were forced to, I think we can very easily implement some of these things in our daily lives going forward to make sure that we continue the good trend of, of consuming more uh, wisely and uh, more sustainably. Uh, and I'm looking forward to contributing to that. 
uh, my trade team, whom I'm sure are all on this call today. Uh, we are seven in total in the, in the consulate in, uh, in Istanbul. We are here to advise uh, all uh, of the Turkish and Danish companies that are interested in doing business with Denmark. And, uh, and uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to turning 2020 into a sustainable business year and, uh, and putting uh, Corona behind us and uh, focusing on the future and all the opportunities that we will uh, definitely have together. That, uh, that was uh, my remarks. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the floor and uh, back to you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arnett. Thanks for your contributions and your strong belief on Turkish economy and bouncing back. Uh, your remarks on uh, making 2020 a sustainable uh, business sharing with uh, Danish and Turkish businessmen and business associations uh, was also appreciated by all our audience, I guess, here and the distinguished panelists. So we will be together working on that heart in 2020 and the following 2021 is much more important uh, for the projects and the projections we have discussed uh, formerly. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Now I would like to continue with uh, Mrs. Ushikkeje, Aishin Ushikkeje. I would identify her as the queen of corporate farmers because uh, under her management she is operating more than uh, 330,000 hectares of land in Turkey uh, by being the chairperson and director general of agricultural enterprises, which means that 50% more than an area of Luxembourg. So the floor is Aishin Hanums, and she's also spent many years on the retail sector and she knows the shelf uh, on this perspective of consumer size. Now she is in this point zero, starting with the seeds and breedings and the cattles and the agricultural production and know both sides of the business and the, both, of the, both sides of the chains. So Aishin Hanım, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emrah Bey. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Aishin Işıkgeci, General Manager and uh, Chairperson of TIGAN. As Emrah Bey told, uh, I started uh, TIGAN two years ago. Uh, I am coming from private sector. Uh, last 28 years, uh, I uh, worked uh, in the retail sector. That's why it's really good experience for me in, in under government. It's first time I'm working under government organization. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, the COVID uh, is a big travel around the world, you know. I will try to give you information about our activities, first of all. Uh, I would like to mention about TIGAM. Uh, first, uh, TIGAM is the biggest farmer, as you told, uh, in Turkey. Uh, it has a history of 700 years. Uh, we are under the authority of the Ministry of Agriculture. We have 17 farms in different locations. You can see on the map. Uh, we are producing certificated seeds and livestock, as you told Emrah Bey. Uh, we breed cattle and sheep uh, and provide them to the farmers. Uh, we are trying to increase the quality uh, of agriculture in Turkey. We also have Arabian racing horses and we have gazelles, goats and dogs. We are protecting their genetics. This is one of the, our important task under TGM. Uh, TGM is an example for Turkish farmers. There are huge investments and technologies in our farms. We are a market leader. Our share is 37%. Uh, last year we had 37% uh, on seeds uh, as a share, but one, one year before in uh, 1918 it was 30. Uh, we increased our share. Uh, we are the, uh, the, the best on the market about quality. Each year we sell 170,000 tons of cereals. This year we started new project. Uh, the first one uh, is the local vegetable product project. We started planting six different national seeds in our farms. Uh, it can be good possibility together with uh, Denmark. Uh, we, can, we can make a trade. 
uh, we are open to make trade about our all articles. Uh, it can be a really good possibility for the both countries. Uh, we started a great, great campaign uh, which is called Native, Native Seed Project. It's really important project, uh, maybe you heard before. Uh, we have collected the forgotten seeds from the villages and planted them. We are trying to project these pr seeds, uh, protect these seeds. And lastly, we started producing cannabis. Cannabis is really important topic also now nowadays, you know, on the world. Uh, this is the new trend and because cannabis has a great industrial value and we are working about this uh, article to produce industrial ca uh, cannabis seeds in our farms. And now we can talk about the pandemic. In the first weeks, there was a great chaos. The country stopped exports, as you know. There was a panic buying in everywhere. It was something new for everyone. Uh, the three organizations, FAO, WHO and WTO, made a joint call for supporting small farmers, expanding aid programs, focusing on bottlenecks, uh, keeping on global trade, and now allowing food inflation. Not allowing food inflation. So what we did in order to be ready for the pandemic, we made an action plan. Now I will give you information about this plan, which we did. We took every health measure in the farms. Our ministry started new policies. We had campaigns for the benefit of the people. We never lost contact with the farmers and the sector. It was really important for us. Uh, maybe we spoke together with you, Emrah Bey, during the pandemic. Each and every day, we spent seven, eight hours in front of computer with the help of Zoom, together with all sector, we made the meetings in order to understand what's happening on the market. Uh, it was really useful for us. I mean, suppliers were together with us, sector by sector. Uh, all uh, all uh, retail groups were together with us. And uh, we understood the stock of the articles, which type of difficulties uh, we have in front of us, we were really checking the market and after checking the market, of course, we made a meeting uh, together with the other ministries in order to take some decisions, important decisions. And it was really fast uh, decisions we did during the pandemic. We formed a science committee within our ministry. We established products desk and uh, allowed, followed the uh, harvest and yield figures. We took our actions according to these figures. For example, when we checked the figures of lemon, because of new harvest was, is, uh, was in September, we noticed that the stock will not be enough. So we limited the export. It was a really important topic during the pandemic. Maybe we checked from the newspapers and, and the other things. Uh, the, the lemon prices were 20 Turkish lira, beginning of the uh, pandemic. And uh, we understood that our stock is not enough and we were uh, sending these articles to the Russia and the other countries and together with trade ministry, we had a decision to stop send articles to, to the other countries and the price decreased from 20 to 4, 5 Turkish dirhams. It was really important uh, topic and also important decision which we had. It was only one example. It means that for each important articles, we checked always market, what's happening on the market, because uh, you know uh, from the other uh, countries, uh, retails, retails were really crowded. Everybody rushed to the retail uh, groups and they bought something and it was really important to have article. Uh, uh, stock was really important topic. We applied all possible measures for preventing the spread of virus and also we published the booklets and distributed to all producers. I mean, the, in order to give them the conscience and also information what's happening on the market. We had a lot of leaflets, bro, uh, booklets, brochures. Uh, we gave them information. We started joint efforts with Tubitak for developing a vaccine. 
uh, we provided empty lands to the producer free of charge for increasing the production. We were not late still, beginning of the uh, corona, and uh, we, we made a production there. Normally, these lands were idle and now they become an uh, additive source additive source of production, this is very valuable because the quantity of the article is really important because we don't know what's happening for the for the next days. I mean, maybe all gates, borders will be closed or it will be open. We don't know. I mean, it's flu in front of us, you know. Our ministry donated 75% of the seed price in 21 cities. TGM also sent 4,000 tons of seeds to five cities. Uh, we came together with the sector with video conference meetings, as I told. Uh, we listened to the problems of the market. It was really crucial for, for, for the market. And also, when we discussed together with the suppliers, retail groups, private sector, they were really happy to have close contact together with us. Uh, travel permits were given for seasonal workers. Uh, the government supported the farmers with subventions. Laws were made easier for the farmers and producers. We made a 20% increase in our purchase price of wheat and barley. There was a surplus in Sibas and Sibrim due to stopping export. As you know, for Sibas and Sibrim, we are sending th these articles to the European countries mainly, and beginning of the uh, pandemic, the gate war was were closed and uh, we had a lot of stock in our hand. We put a fixed price for them in all markets. We work together with market in order to finish that stocks because you know they are fresh. Uh, we should sell in the, in the short uh, term. Finally, we finished all the stocks. This was a good example for solidarity. Uh, we established a small facility and started producing masks in our farms for TGAM, especially it was a good example. The wife of the workers, they started to produce masks because, you know, it was not easy to, to find masks. And uh, for the other, my farms also, this example, uh, we, we, we made a producing uh, mask in our uh, facilities because also we are using uh, and it wasn't enough from the market. That's why we did by ourselves. We established a digital agricultural market called DITAP. Maybe you heard, I mean, 29th of uh, April. Yes, we, we made a last month uh, about that topic. It's really important because face-to-face -face communication is not easy during the pandemic. Uh, that's why uh, this is really important uh, project data. With this platform, our farmers find market of their products and our consumer will have a good quality products. Small producers are not crushed. We have more than 10,000 members of data now nowadays. Every day it is increasing. It is really good platform to become together about supply and demand to find market for the food article uh, especially. Now uh, we made last month for the phase one. Uh, now we are working for phase two. Uh, all animal products will come in and uh, the, the articles will, en will enlarge. Unfortunately, we have seen long supermarket lines and empty shelves during this pandemic. We did not experience such things in Turkey, but we understood again that food is really important. So we started another campaign in coordination with FAO the name of the campaign is Save Your Food. Uh, we want to be a confident for the future. Food is important. We know this. So we need to uh, decrease the waste as much as possible for everyone. It is really important topic, you know. We will continue about our project. And also we are open to make trade uh, with Denmark. Uh, we, can, we can make a common meetings. Uh, in order to find way about some articles uh, in order to create good trade in, in between two countries. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks, Aishin Hanım, for this valuable presentation. TGM uh, is, of course, a, the biggest player in agricultural production uh, and having the responsibility to be a model in Turkey for the farmers. Being the corporate farmers, TGM uh, has inaugurated the DTAP Digital Agricultural Market Platform, which also enables us for the post-COVID era which makes our farmers and stakeholders in agricultural sector to meet in the same platform, which also the digitalization of agriculture is also a point and a very crucial point and a very crucial target for TIGA. Uh, thanks, Aishin Hanım, uh, for your contribution. And the waste uh, from your presentation is one of the most crucial points. You know, the cliche, statement that we have to grow more than 50 percent for coming 2050 but looking at the fact that coming from the farm to fork we have approximately 45 percent of loss and waste in the whole chain if we can reduce this loss and waste chain up to five percent this 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 means that we don't necessarily have to grow more than 50 percent than ever to feed this coming population. So waste and loss is a great issue. All the campaigns, all the things that will attract consumers awareness on that point is crucial and much more appreciated and being supported by all stakeholders and by us and all the farmers. Thank you, Aishin Hanım. The, our next um, distinguished panelist is Aichi uh, Mrs. Özildirim from CHR Hansen. CHR Hansen, as all you know, is a reputable company for more than 145 years of history back and uh, is the most sustainable company uh, on its expertise. So the floor is yours, Aichan. Thank you very much. I hope uh, you have a full screen. Uh, thank you very much again for, for the opportunity. Uh, as Emrape stated, uh, Christian Hansen uh, has been selected uh, the most sustainable company in the world. Uh, and I will come to that. Uh, but um, today the topic is very much on food uh, safety, food security and sustainability, uh, especially after the, the post-corona. Um, just about us, if you don't know Christian Hansen, it's a bioscience company uh, and uh, we develop not only solutions for food, but also for pharma and agricultural industries. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not a new company, it's 146 years old and uh, we hope to continue this way. Uh, regarding sustainability awards, we, we actually got uh, nominated by Corporate Knights uh, in the, in, as number one in last year and we are number two this year. Uh, the, the first one is also a Danish company uh, called Ørsted, uh, and it's they, they are in wholesale power business. Uh, the reason why we were actually uh, nominated, uh, were uh, actually selected, was that 82% uh, of our revenue contributes positively to the UN goals. Uh, I will come back to the UN goals, and we work especially on uh, focused on uh, three of them very much. Um, when you look about the, uh, the, the world problems, uh, we need to think how, we've, how to feed 10 billion people by 2050, as it was just mentioned, uh, and uh, do, to do this in a sustainable way. Um, actually, uh, the 60 percent of the global consumers are worried about climate change and they're right to do so. Uh, because uh, we, we waste so much food and actually there's also losses uh, in supply chain and otherwise. And if that would be a country, it would be a country, uh, the third biggest contributor uh, to the uh, gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions after uh, US and China. So it's a big, big thing. Uh, and actually if we reduce that, we would also feed more people naturally. Um, so some of the global challenges are, uh, firstly, there are a lot of people to feed. 
uh, and this has to be done in a sustainable way. Uh, the food production should be also sustainable. Secondly, uh, the one third of the all food is wasted. So it's a big, big thing. Uh, and you see a yogurt picture here. I'll come back to that uh, because uh, almost 20% is wasted when it comes to dairy. So uh, as we increase, uh, as we also see in, the, in this current corona crisis, uh, there are a lot of uh, burden on healthcare. Uh, currently, uh, the, the 700,000 people are dead each year uh, because of uh, resistant infections. And this, is, uh, this number will go up dramatically in coming years. Uh, approximately um, in uh, 2050, um, the, the number uh, will rise to 10 million deaths per year if no other precautions are taken. So Christina Hansen basically works in, uh, to, to, stop, to find solutions to these three main problems. And, um, and uh, as you can see on the, on, the, on the slide, there are three uh, UN uh, SDGs are listed here uh, that we work on, that we specifically work on. So today the topic is food waste and uh, why should we reduce food waste? Because uh, there are a lot of hungry people on earth and if we could just save the 25% of the waste, that would feed all the hungry people in the world. So it also contributes to the Zero Hunger Initiative of the UN. Uh, and also the, the number 12 is uh, responsible production. So we should also take care about that. Um, when you look at the, the, the three uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which I think also Umut Bey will touch base on. Uh, these three are very much in line with the products of Christian Hansen. That's why we selected these three. So to give an example, uh, we have solutions for each of them. And I don't want to go into detail, but you can have more uh, efficient production uh, or increase uh, crop yields. So you can get out of the land uh, per square meter, you get more crop or you get more out of milk. Uh, when you look uh, the, the, to the health aspect, you have much more, um, uh, you can increase your immune system and therefore get less affected by uh, diseases. And the same is valid for animal health as well. Uh, but today the topic is food waste and I will talk more about that. Uh, so you can protect your food without any chemicals by completely natural ways using some of our solutions. So what does food cultures do? Actually, food cultures can help your food fresh and safe. Uh, and it's not only applied in dairy, but also we see more and more uh, ready to eat foods and salads. It could be applied in dairy uh, for sure, uh, both cheese and yogurt and others in wine and meat and fish. So our aim is not only extending shelf life by natural means, uh, but also keeping your products fresher for longer. Uh, that means uh, you can spoil the yogurt in the supply chain, uh, but also uh, in your fridge. So to eliminate these things, you put some good bacteria into the yogurt or into other products listed here to extend shelf life. It's a natural way uh, and it's completely um, validated by a lot of customers of ours as well. So uh, the overall aim is increasing product quality and safety, therefore decreasing food waste both at home or in supply chain and creating more sustainable production methods for our customers. So um, how does, how does uh, the, the bacteria do that? Uh, the, the food cultures help extending shelf life. And uh, the first uh, graph on the left uh, is without any, bio, uh, any bioprotection. Uh, you see, for example, in the day 15 or 20, um, some kind of uh, mold in your yogurt. 
Uh, and if you add the good bacteria that help protecting the yogurt, you can see it maybe on the day 30 or 25. So it, it just shifts, it adds another hurdle to protect your, what you have produced nicely. Um, so coming to waste, actually 30% of the yogurt waste could be reduced with that. And you can see this is actually yogurt produced on the same date. It's unbelievable, but this one has this good bacteria in it. This one has, um, uh, hasn't that, and this one is uh, completely nothing is added. So we all might come across the, uh, to this uh, in our fridge if things go wrong. Um, so dairy, why dairy? Because dairy uh, is uh, both uh, um, consumed widely uh, and also is very fragile uh, in supply chain and has relatively short shelf life. Uh, Actually, uh, in the after Corona, what happened? This this report I got from Euromonitor lately, and uh, when you look, uh, packaged good is uh, the more or less the only item that has uh, increased in sales, and although it was expected to decrease if there would be no Corona. So after Corona, we can see the six percent increase in packaged goods. So people tend to buy more packaged goods because they're afraid of uh, the artisanal or other production methods. Uh, well, if, uh, if that, uh, you can see uh, it's increased. So, um, and these sentences I copied from the report as well, actually it's very much in line what I was just telling you since uh, some uh, minutes. So uh, in the short to mid term, uh, after COVID is expected to uh, change con consumer priorities, food waste, animal welfare, food security will be frontlined much more than ever. Uh, the healthy eating will become more important. So actually the, the, what we uh, think of natural, healthy, reducing food waste is very relevant to discuss right now. So I will, uh, just show a movie. Uh, I hope I can do it technically, <laughs> but uh, we will. Uh, I will just stop sharing and share again, um, and I will come back. Food waste is a global challenge, with one third of all food being wasted. In the dairy industry, 20% is wasted, and 80% of the yogurt waste is related to a short best before date. Christian Hansen has identified a set of good bacteria and combined them into bioprotective cultures that help dairy products stay fresh for longer and reduce food waste in an all natural way. If these bioprotective cultures were applied to all yogurt in Europe, it could reduce waste with 30% simply by extending the shelf life. A study commissioned by Christian Hansen and reviewed by leading European researchers looked at the socio-economic impact of extending the shelf life of yogurt using natural means. The study looks at the environmental impact what could happen to food waste throughout the supply chain, and also looks at economic incentives for the different actors within that supply chain. One of the key findings from it is that there are situations, highly plausible situations, in which there are economic benefits for both dairy manufacturers and retailers, while still reducing food waste across the supply chain. I think this study could have a real positive benefit. It could be a real catalyst for change. It could be be that spark that gets dairy manufacturers and retailers to adopt a natural method for extending the shelf life. I think that increasing the shelf life maybe three or four days would definitely make a difference for um, stores like, like these. If the shelf life of yogurt gets extended. Uh, you're in trouble did this. Unfortunately we couldn't see, we could only hear. 
Aa, e, baştan başlatayım çünkü güzel bir şey. Aa, tekrar deniyorum. Kusura bakmayın. Evet, bugün şansımız yavar gitmedi herhalde olmayacak. Uh, sorry about it, um, but um, I think uh, it's quite clear that uh, reducing food waste has an impact. We can do it naturally and that savings of food waste would benefit us both economically but also, um, but also uh, just feeding more people on earth. So, um, Uh, with that, I uh, wish to thank you all for listening to me and I would be open for questions and I will, I can send the link to the presentation and the um, video if need be. Uh, thank you, Ayça Hanım. Thanks for your contribution and the good practices under Hansen, uh, which you have mentioned. Maybe we could share the link of the video from our mm -hmm. chat panel. Uh, the panelists could uh, have time to watch that video. Unfortunately, technically, we couldn't watch it. Um, and your uh, remarks in healthy eating, yes, healthy eating will become even much more important than ever. This is important. Food, food waste, animal welfare, and food security will be front lines. This is what we are also experiencing uh, during COVID-19 and after COVID-19 will be be having much more keen on food security and food waste issues. Thanks for your presentation. We will be uh, keeping touch in the Q&A session with you. And now our uh, final distinguished panelist is Dr. Umut Kerolu, the country director of Novozymes. Uh, Novozymes is also a very reputable international global company. Uh, is committed to help solving three problems Before Umut Bey will be mentioning, I would like to remark uh, three global challenges, which is climate, water and sustainable production and consumption. So uh, Novozymes is the championship and leader of biological solution in its era. And the floor is yours, Umut Bey. Thank you, Emra Bey. Thank you very much. Um, and also, um, thanks for everyone joining. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, having a lot of people with this uh, sustainability mindset around the table and then listening to them is just, uh, I would say, another day of an eye opener also for me. Also, thanks for bringing us together and as well uh, the opportunity given. So, um, from one side, I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, I have just uh, two to th you know, three slides, just pictures. I'm not gonna bore you with that, with a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, verbose things. But just before that, you know, there are always, uh, so to say, advantages and disadvantages starting early or uh, finishing at the end. So the, the, the good thing is all the clever, so to say, people before you bringing really good insight to the table, the challenge is what else you can bring to the table. So, and if you don't mind, I guess, uh, I just want to refer a couple of things that, you know, that the, uh, the uh, distinguished panelists uh, brought to the table, just a kind of refresher and as well uh, making sure that I just don't want to overlap with the other things. So um, I think you started with especially the uh, insecurity of the food and as well, you know, the limitations that we have in Rappe that I believe, uh, you know, COVID-19, prior to COVID-19, no one would have expected that this is, or that's the reason why it just generated this disruption. Uh, Anette underlined the importance of uh, why we should all contribute. I think it was a great statement also she did. Like, you know, we have seen that change is one, you know, in majority cases, change is extremely difficult, but COVID-19 made us change 
very fast in an agile way. So it's just, uh, I would say, another thing that probably no one would uh, predict. And um, Aishin Anu was also uh, mentioning um, um, agility from one side. From the other side, the, the importance of togetherness, why we should do this all together, because, uh, you know, when I'm going to speak about neuroscience, I'm going to also bring it to the table. You know, we are just, uh, um, you know, strong as we are together. You know, we are just uh, as much as impactful as long as we are uh, together. Better. And then um, uh, I Chan uh, brought the importance of food waste, that if I also combine it with what you have said, by uh, from one side, we keep hearing this, it's becoming a cliche, but it is also, uh, you know, called truth that there will be 3 billion more people in the earth by 2050, which means there are more mouths to feed, where I believe, you know, the the activities or the actions that we are taking right now will be a kind of uh, game changer by 2050. If we are going to do the things in the way that it should be, we will see the positive outcome of it and vice versa. But from one side, let me, sc let me share my screen. And, um, and from the other side, maybe just um, add uh, three things, uh, I would say from a, um, from a uh, perspective of, uh, uh, you know, what COVID-19 brought to the perspective. One is, uh, by the way, you see me looking at my left and right, and I have multiple screens and notes here and there, so don't, uh, uh, sorry for that one. Um, and, um, you know, one thing I believe uh, COVID-19 proved is still we are so vulnerable. So, you know, the supply chains that we have, you know, is, uh, you know, the healthcare systems, like that's also the reason of all these lockdowns, immediate lockdowns, we still are vulnerable. It just showed, that, showed us how vulnerable we are. The other thing is, you know, uh, we keep speaking about uh, generating supply chains which is self-feeding itself or which is self-sufficient and another thing you see you know when we look at for example grain markets majority of the grain products are being produced in one part of the globe and then being delivered into another and when your supply chain is disrupted, the borders are closed, there is no way that you can bring it and feed your people. So that's why in sustainable ways, we just need to make our countries self-sufficient. So I think this is, this is an eye-opener to, I don't know, every part of every stakeholder or all the stakeholders in a, in a, in a country, be it governmental, non-governmental, you know, the corporations, wherever they are, you know, this is a true eye opener and another reason why we should work together. And uh, the other thing is, you know, the um, probably like, uh, you know, uh, prior to COVID-19, we were so much on digitization and, you know, how we can use the digital on, you know, mining the data, working on the data, generating outcomes uh, uh, with it. But we, we also understood that, look, still the large part of uh, food and beverage and agricultural industries are, you know, on a kind of manpower base. So you just need to, uh, you just need to have your manpower. You just need to have your manpower also uh, in perspective uh, and uh, you just uh, make sure that you just produce from one side and from the other side, um, from the other side, you just got back to the, uh, to the production and then bring it to the, to the, uh, to the people. Um, that said, uh, I hope now you see my screen uh, in, a, in a, you know, the beginning of my presentation. Um, if, um, you know, with that opportunity and maybe a kind of, uh, uh, you know, so to say long uh, 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 introduction, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on, um, on Novozymes. It's not because that we really don't do great things, but we just definitely do. And I just wanna spend some time on the reason why we do that. So, um, you know, 
all of us, the ones in, you know, working in the, uh, so to say, the corporations or in the professional business life, we keep speaking about the missions and visions of our companies and, uh, you know, uh, on, uh, on uh, you know, what we are delivering uh, from products and services point of view. Uh, when it comes to novel science, we call it as purpose, uh, or so to say, the reason why we do this. And um, we are also a Danish company like uh, um, all the other Danish companies, we are also extremely purpose-driven, sustainability-driven. And, uh, you know, uh, the basic reason why we do this is mainly, uh, you know, we just aim for better lives. So this is why we do that. And uh, the world is growing. Uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to be able to secure these better lives. And uh, we just, uh, with our all biological solutions, uh, uh, you know, all of our products are either enzymes or microbes that we find it from uh, mama nature, we call it. And uh, all this, uh, so to say, natural part of mama helps us, uh, you know, uh, producing these uh, enzymes, these microbes, and then bring it to the people uh, together and uh, and that's the reason why when um, Ashinan was uh, mentioning togetherness as well uh, and Rappe was just well yes it is impossible if you are not in this together so um, as said we uh, from one side have our purpose doing things and from the other side we are also uh, you know, uh, uh, you know from the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals we also have some focus areas among this, uh, so to say, 17 elements in here. Um, well, Aichanam uh, has mentioned, uh, you know, a couple of those, especially the three of them, uh, and uh, how Christian Hansen, you know, uh, focuses on those. I'm going to also uh, speak a little on to this, but uh, all in all, if you look at the 17 different uh, development goals or SDGs, uh, Nobu Zymes is focusing mainly six of it, given the nature of it as business, given the nature of what we do. So they are, you know, we are just uh, having, so to say, initiatives around uh, zero hunger, uh, which is the second one here. And uh, we also have, uh, you know, uh, initiatives on uh, climate action, on uh, quality education, on clean water and sanitation. For example, um, um, clean water is a strategic opportunity area for Novo Zymes, which is, it is also even not a business area for us. We just uh, focus on it because by 2030 and 2050, uh, you know, uh, we, we know that water will become clean water and reaching to clean water will be a difficulty. We also focus on uh, responsible consumption and production. And, uh, you know, like many uh, Danish companies, uh, we proudly also focus on affordable and uh, clean energy. Um, th that said, if I, uh, you know, we keep speaking, that biological answers are, or biological solutions are our core, so to say, business. Um, it is also worth to say that we have uh, three divisions in our organization that each of them are focusing on certain, so to say, business areas. One of them is called agricultural and bioenergy, where we have our enzymes and microbes for improvement of agricultural and bioenergy uh, products or uh, yeah, uh, uh, industries. Then we have food and beverage, and we have, we call it as health, household care and technical industries, which is the enzymes and the microbes mainly we use for, you know, uh, hand washers, dishwashers, textiles, um, you know, water treatments and all that stuff. Uh, that said, and uh, given the context, uh, I'm going to, um, I'm going to spend time on uh, speaking the, uh, you know, the areas, which is, for today's uh, perspective, falling under uh, food and beverage, bioagriculture, and animal animal health and nutrition. Uh, but you know, w w when you look at these, um, and also maybe referring to uh, the uh, so to say the growing population by 2050, and it is and uh, the pressure it is uh, putting into the supply chain, into the production. When we look at our solutions in food and beverage. 
the solutions that we have are mainly for you know improving the uh, you know the efficiency of production is uh, so to say producing more with less so to say and also you know enabling products to be uh, you know uh, remaining longer in the shelf life good examples came from uh, ichanam uh, uh, for yogurt production on biopreservation uh, Another example could be bread, like, you know, majority of the breads that we have purchased from the shelves of uh, supermarkets, they have a certain shelf life and just it stays fresh in the shelf. So the fact which now COVID-19 pressed us or pressurized us, uh, you know, buying more packed foods uh, with this hygiene focus and hygiene focus and all that stuff, you know, having this longer shelf lives or remaining fresh in the shelf became an important thing in a vast majority of the, so to say, processed food. So from one side, you are improving the processability, you are improving the efficiency, and from the other side, you just make it stay longer in the shelf. Then when you look at the bioagriculture, um, you know, we have our solutions, mainly biostimulants or mainly uh, products, which is helping the efficiency of a crop uh, per acre of a, an, uh, of a land. So um, I was, uh, it was a total eye opener to me when I was once speaking with a colleague when he said that, look, a per acre efficiency of, uh, uh, of a grain, sorghum, so to say, in Italy, is six, six times higher than, say, that in Africa, in Kenya. Well, I just thought that, look, you know, we have the land, but we don't have enough, so to say, efficiency to produce uh, the, so to say, the right amount of the product and probably not with the right, so to say, uh, 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 quality parameters. So now when you look at what we have, we have products that we just coat the seed of any kind of grain that this seed becomes more, so to say, tolerant to the adverse conditions, be it, I would say, uh, overheat, be it over cold, like then or, you know, uh, uh, so to say, uh, it makes the seed more to, you know, more tolerant to these adverse conditions. And with this way, you just increase the efficiency or increase the total output from a per acre of a, of a, of a land. of uh, examples from our animal health and nutrition area. Uh, we also, uh, you know, from one side, uh, you know, Ashin Adam was also explaining, you know, the, you know, the uh, number of uh, cattle and, you know, the sheep and this and that we have. From one side, the number is important, but from the other side, again, the efficiency is also important that when you feed these animals, the, you know, the nutrition of it and the biodigestibility of it should be also on the right side to be able to get the right outcome or the efficient uh, outcome from this, uh, so to say, uh, uh, and from you know these protein sources because in the end they are the protein sources for us. So that said, uh, uh, here comes my uh, uh, my uh, last slide, and uh, maybe I just spent uh, uh, speaking uh, half of my time, or maybe one third of my time, also speaking also the examples like here. But uh, as you can see, uh, this uh, so to say this. Um, uh, you know, these 17 sustainability uh, goals, one way or the other, uh, just uh, given these uh, three examples, are connected to, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Novozymes uh, uh, products, one way or the other, uh, from zero hunger point of view, from food, food phase uh, point of view, and also um, as underlined, producing more with a kind of less point of view. And um, that said, um, maybe a um, final thing that, uh, uh, you know, I would be um, underlining in here is uh, maybe uh, uh, if, we, if we consider, you know, if, when we look at all these uh, sustainability activities that we have, uh, you know, all these, uh, so to say, initiatives running here and there, uh, the, the efficiency question we should also ask ourselves that, you know, we have all these separate activities together, uh, but we should be thinking 
uh, altogether have to uh, probably make it more efficient and uh, take more outcome uh, with it. And I just want to close with our, um, uh, so to say, uh, um, uh, positioning that we, from one side, uh, look for a better world and uh, having this one is just uh, continuously possible, continuously with rethinking tomorrow. So let's rethink it and then uh, uh, look for the ways of uh, doing it better. With that, um, um, maybe I'm a little over time. Uh, you never know when I speak sustainability and rugby. If it is, uh, sorry for that one. Uh, but with that, back on to you. And uh, thanks for listening. And thanks everyone uh, being here around the table. Uh, thank you, Mutpe. You're quite good at timing, this time at least. <laughs> you thank were you. sustainable. <laughs> Regarding the topic sustainability, your timing was sustainable enough. Uh, your remarks, your highlights was BioX solutions, um, refreshing the shelf, fresh for longer, bio solutions, bio agriculture, and seed tolerance. Seed tolerance is very crucial due to these climate changes and climate changes will be affecting our own productions, the whole world's production, approximately the food prices will go up 84% according to FAO's uh, reports in 2019 in the following 20 years. So climate change coming from the fact that COVID-19 made us much more aware about the risk and the uncertainty the climate change also is a big issue, which is also having, a, uh, unfortunately, a positive correlations, a strong correlation between risk and uncertainty, which means that seed tolerancy is very, very crucial. And the bio solutions, which also European Union Green Deal is also keen on uh, these bio solutions for the following years, which means that I know that Novazymes coming from the years of 2014 with the BioEgg Alliance in a, with a company, global company, they're, you're trying more than 100,000 trials, plots of trials in hectares, in huge quantities, the bio solutions for inputs for good and healthy uh, agricultural production. So thanks for your presentation and let me continue with Aicha Hanum and try her yogurt applications for extending shelf life of yogurt and let's try the video again and then we have three questions to be answered. I will divert the questions to you by to each our distinguished panelists. I will try again. Please tell me if you can't see it. We will. Food waste is a global challenge, with one third of all food being wasted. In the dairy industry, 20% is wasted, and 80% of the yogurt waste is related to a short best before date. Christian Hansen has identified a set of good bacteria and combined them into bioprotective cultures that help dairy products stay fresh for longer and reduce food waste in an all natural way. If these bioprotective cultures were applied to all yogurt in Europe, it could reduce waste with 30% simply by extending the shelf life. A study commissioned by Christian Hansen and reviewed by leading European researchers looked at the socio-economic impact of extending the shelf life of yogurt using natural means. The study looks at the environmental impact what could happen to food waste throughout the supply chain and also looks at economic incentives for the different actors within that supply chain. One of the key findings from it is that there are situations, highly plausible situations, in which there are economic benefits for both dairy manufacturers and retailers while still reducing food waste across the supply chain. I think this study could have a real positive benefit. It could be a real catalyst for change. It could be that spark that gets dairy manufacturers and retailers to adopt a natural method for extending the shelf life. I think that increasing the shelf life by maybe three or four days 
would definitely make a difference for um, stores like, like these. If the shelf life of yoghurt gets extended using something like Fresh Q in a natural way, then we know from lots of studies that consumers often look for products on the shelf with the longest possible shelf life. So there's the opportunity for manufacturers that are producing yogurt with longer shelf life that they could gain market share as a result of this. Dairy manufacturers, retailers and regulators, they all want to find solutions to reduce food waste. But they're all asking the same question, what do consumers think? To answer the question, we had an independent agency set up a consumer panel where they tested products with a longer shelf life all naturally. Sie haben heute einen Joghurt getestet, der eine längere Haltbarkeit von sieben Tagen hatte. Was war Ihr Eindruck über diesen Joghurt? Ähm, also ich habe da eigentlich keinen großen Unterschied geschmeckt. Würde es Ihr Einkaufsverhalten ändern, wenn Sie die Möglichkeit hätten, einen 100% natürlichen Joghurt zu kaufen, der auch eine längere Haltbarkeit hat? Ähm, wenn der Joghurt aus 100% Naturstoffen ähm, besteht und dadurch eine längere Haltbarkeit hat, würde ich auch mehr Joghurt kaufen. Ich würde mehr davon kaufen, ja. Wären Sie auch bereit, 5 Cent pro Kilo Joghurt mehr dafür auszugeben? Ja, auch 10 Cent. I think one of the really interesting conclusions from this uh, consumer panel was that if you actually inform consumers about the benefit a product can have on food waste, well, that means they actually prefer that product. Christian Hansen has embarked on a journey to fight food waste using good, natural bacteria. We invite you to join us in this fight. Together, we can make a difference. The fouls, huh? Yeah, my channel, thanks for sharing. It, it was worth trying it for the third time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anything extending shelf life, anything uh, contributing on food waste is much more appreciated than ever. Uh, what we are aware after COVID-19 post era, uh, we have seen that fresh for longer extending shelf life with bio solutions, natural solutions will be much more discussed and will be much more in, on the table during coming years. So with your permission, I would like to uh, have our audiences uh, questions uh, and start with um, Aishin Hanım. Um, and uh, for the question to Aishin Hanım, there are actually two questions. Uh, one of them was uh, a recent question. Uh, the first one, uh, how does Turkey secure and sustain national food security in terms of food variety and storage? optimum volumes and ge geographical storage locations? This is the first question. The second question, uh, Aishin Hanım, is from uh, Nils Lersch Peterson. In your presentation, you spoke about vaccines and one of the slides, and which kind of vaccines and was conducted and uh, what was the effect? The, the second question was that. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, for the first questions, uh, for the first question, we are promoting the licensed warehouse uh, in our country, as you know. Uh, our aim is to stop uh, product waste, uh, decrease shipment cost, and uh, taking trade under registration uh, is really important. Also, we are uh, providing a price market state stability. Our capacity uh, is about 5 million tons. Uh, we have 91 companies in 130 points. Uh, the government uh, is also giving subventions uh, for the farmers choosing licensed warehouse. Uh, and also our quality assurance responsibility uh, persons are working about the standards because if we check uh, Corona, uh, it's something different than the other standards. I mean, who is selling food? who is transferring food, uh, who is keeping food in the warehouse, uh, has to have uh, some different uh, standards. That's why quality assurance uh, responsibility guys, they are writing a guide, uh, they are writing a new standards uh, because it's something totally different than the other standards, you know. Uh, and it will help us about 
the keeping that food or selling the, these foods or transferring these foods, it will be really important for, for us because there is no example for the other countries also. It's something new and it, it's protecting us from the corona effect. About vaccine, uh, to be honest, I'm not too much deep, uh, but uh, we are working in some different uh, departments. I mean, under uh, agricultural uh, organization, we are working, uh, and also the other ministries, they are working about vaccine. And uh, now nowadays, they are discovering some new things. They are making some trials on horse, especially. Uh, in order to see the result. Uh, but what was the last situation on the vaccine? To be honest, I'm not clear now. Uh, they can they can follow the, the news on magazines and the others we can distribute uh, if we have something new. Thank you, Ashin Hanım, for your explanations and uh, the uh, uh, recent updates on the uh, two questions. Also, Turkey, uh, with geographical uh, opportunities uh, is having the opportunity to uh, uh, depot uh, more than 2.5 million tons of potatoes in Nevşehir region where there is there is under um, cave digged under cave natural depots we approximately uh, keep our potatoes and potato tubers uh, for up to 2.5 million tons in Nevşehir region where we know as uh, Urgüp and Peribacaları for balloon sailing. Uh, the geographical uh, location is also a touristic location, but the other side of the location is well known with uh, naturally warehousing of potatoes. Uh, a contribution on my side regarding the agricultural capabilities of turkeys for logistics. And the second question uh, to Ayça Hanım and Umut Bey, you can answer both. Um, how uh, you would like to prefer, uh, and I can also support you on that uh, question. Uh, how soon digitalization and artificial intelligence and advanced technologies will be applied in agriculture, and what kind of educational requirements does such a widespread application entail? And what is Denmark's experience in this regards, uh, rather than Turkey, what is Denmark's experience in this regards? Thank you. Um, so you want to go first, like ladies first? Or do you want me to take it? Umut Bey, buyurun. Well, I think, um, I think it's a good question because, you know, um, uh, you know, in the end, digitization, um, you know, we keep speaking about it. We keep speaking highly about it. And, um, <laughs> and uh, from one side, um, uh, you know, it has benefits, and I was also mentioning during my, so to say, uh, uh, um, you know, part, especially from one side, you just need to set up the digitization in a way that it just gives you the right outcome uh, for your decisions, to base your decisions. From the other side, you still, uh, you know, uh, need to design the things with the, uh, with the brain power. So this is, this is important. So I think, then this is, you know, uh, what, what, what we need to do is just to combine the things into each other. Two examples that I have thought of when you were asking the question. One was, you know, um, you know, given that we do the business in biotechnology area and biotechnology, since everything is just natural, you just need to mimic the natural conditions when you are developing something. And all this uh, mimicking, what kind of natural differences might happen from a temperature point of view, from a pH point of view, from a, you know, from a, I don't know what kind of, uh, in the end, we just, what we do is, uh, is biology, all these DNAs, uh, you know, uh, we just work on these things. So as much you are able to simulate the things, that much you are able to derive outcomes uh, with that and roughly. So, uh, you know, you, you, you also refer to the seed coatings, for example, you just from one side, collect the data, then mine it, then uh, so to say model it. And then once you model, you just need to get the, okay, so what is the right then, the, you know, the seed stimulant or the coating, which will be the most adaptable to these conditions. So that's why what we do, we just, you know, collect the data, mine it, model it, and try to fit into this one. 
uh, that's why uh, seed coatings could be an area that I can refer. Another thing would be, uh, we also know that, you know, the, the animal proteins are becoming extremely expensive and also uh, generating too much of carbon dioxide that we are from the other side trying to get, you know, carbon neutral. And that's why the protein ingredients or the protein from vegetable sources is also becoming important. But the taste is different. The uh, texture is different. That's why we also collect data, especially from the fact that, okay, so what kind of protein profile we have and what kind of, uh, so to say, flavor and texture that it has, and then start uh, generating our products to be able to generate a protein profile, which is, uh, so to say, digestible, palatable, uh, and efficient from that perspective. So, uh, these two examples, uh, I hope, can uh, make the, uh, the participants to do a kind of connection between how digitization can be used in, in uh, so to say, in uh, uh, um, sustainability, uh, so to say, efforts, if it covers. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Mutbe. Maybe I will go on with a, uh, another question with Aichanam. Before that, that, I also want to contribute on that topic. Uh, Industry 4.0, which is also um, uh, well known uh, and coming up with the mass production, maybe not with the agricultural production, uh, on the food chain side, on the food production side, yes, but for the agricultural production still is, it is a debate. Um, I always emphasize on the uh, more than numbers, the philosophy of digitalization in agriculture which means that human resources, which I call human precious, uh, human valuables, uh, human values, are, are still uh, placing a majority role of the agricultural production, which means that you cannot digitize the whole chain of agricultural production 100%, which means that 80% of the farming in the world globally is being implement, implemented by family farmers, which also results with not only an agricultural production, is a way of life, which means that you cannot digitize people's way of living by making all the chains in agricultural production like you make in the automotive industry or the other industries. So digitalization to a certain extent should be used as a platform and leverage in agricultural production but cannot and should not change the way of people's living, livelihoods, which people in rural areas is aiming to have their lives and the way of life and gainings from farming. This is one contribution also on my side. Thank you. Emphasizing on the social aspect of agricultural production and agricultural population globally. So, Aichan, there is a much more um, uh, specific question. If you don't mind, I would like to divert it to you. Uh, our, one of our um, hey, audience. Okay. Yeah. Before coming to the next question, I could also yeah. say a couple of words regarding digitalization. Uh, uh, just uh, regarding uh, agriculture, um, actually, it's been used to some extent with drone imaging, precision farming, landscaping. However, uh, that impact to our current business today is minimal. Uh, it could be game-changing in the future 10, 20 years. Uh, we know that the Danish universities are looking into this, but uh, we don't know how advanced they are at the moment. Uh, so uh, regarding other, uh, other services we offer, we, we use a lot of more uh, of digitalization, uh, not only in agriculture, but also, for example, milk collection, of, uh, in phage uh, and, and uh, in many other aspects, we start to use uh, heavily uh, the digital services because uh, it increases speed and uh, visibility. So that's uh, just to add to your comments. Yeah, thanks for your contribution. Uh, while keeping with you uh, from Borga Aruta, uh, is emphasizing on the importance of uh, extension of shelf life of yogurt, but uh, maybe there could be a, a hesitation or a concern from our consumer size, uh, emphasizing on 
if the shelf if shelf life will cause a shift on consumer demand for the larger packages and this can keep the waste problem ongoing what is your opinion about this and actually uh if if the consumer buys a one five kilogram pack instead of uh, one kilogram times five that will overall reduce the pack size and uh, reduce the waste uh, in terms of packaging uh, and if that five kilogram yogurt keeps fresh along his shelf life and could be consumed within that period uh, there would be basically less waste uh, maybe i didn't understand the question uh, the question was that if the shelf life extends to a certain extent and we have much more shelf life than uh, before uh, will the consumer demand uh, towards on buying much more than they need which means that is this also could be possibly result with a food waste um i believe not because now uh, also it's uh uh, some companies in the Scan in Scandinavia started to put also uh, not only best before dates but also good after dates. So people tend to uh, uh, smell uh, the product or look visually and still consume it uh, if the date is uh, expired. Uh, so this this is like emerging trend actually. So I don't expect that to happen. Uh, thanks. Thanks for your answer. Another question, maybe I could answer that. Uh, can you please share your opinions about recovery after the corona, uh, corona crisis about food services with relevant technologies? Yes, we see in South, uh, South uh, East and Far East, uh, actually, uh, that the online um, fresh fruit and food um, categories is extended up to 40% of the whole online sales versus we see um, only single digits in Europe uh, in food categories. So there is a huge gap on this online platform for Europe countries and for Turkey even and for the other rest of the um, world that the humans, the consumers uh, awareness and consumers interest on buying online services which also needs to improve uh, online platform deliveries in each country and each location uh, will be the new challenge and uh, will be the new era of the trade and the big volumes and uh, just-in-time deliveries for the shelf life uh, without regarding the uh, improvements in shelf life extension uh, is uh, going to be a huge challenge and the trade I think 50% uh, of the trade uh, for food categories uh, will be online in the upcoming years and will be available via applications as you may also experience as you're experiencing for the last three months uh, extraordinarily. Maybe I could have the answer to that question and uh, I, I, I like to continue with Annette. Um, the question there were two questions actually and um, uh, the first question is what kind of opportunities are there in in denmark turkey collaboration for the circular economy transformation which also denmark is very keen on and have a uh, vast expertise and experience on circular economy the second question was from figen hanım uh, he was the ch uh, chairperson of co women cooperatives in turkey and likes to collaborate with women cooperatives in Denmark and trying to uh, have uh, the engagements and the networking uh, channels uh, to contact with the, uh, the Danish women cooperatives. Uh, two questions, uh, Annette. Uh, we can't hear. Yeah. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me start with the first one, of course, being the first uh, female consul general in uh, from Denmark in Turkey uh, in Istanbul um, and having a, a largely uh, female dominated trade team I'm a huge advocate of, <laughs> of uh, cooperation and of course also uh, women's uh, 
women's uh, partnerships and societies because there is still a gap to be filled in respect of women in leadership, both in Turkey but also in Denmark. So I'll be more than happy uh, to, uh, to set up a meeting uh, and continue this uh, bilaterally because I think, uh, and, and just send me an email and, and we will react on that and I will find out specifically what in Denmark could be of interest uh, in this context. But we have a lot of uh, different organizations in Denmark, a lot of uh, women's societies, business clubs, um, all sorts of, uh, of interesting activities uh, for women in business that I can introduce uh, to anybody who would like to be introduced to that. So, so that was uh, that one. In respect of circular economy, I think uh, first and foremost, it's really e uh, important to emphasize that this is just not a, a feel good thing. This is actually really good for the economy. Uh, circular uh, economy is predicted if, if implemented in Denmark fully, uh, that transformation by 2035 uh, would be able to increase our GDP with 6 billion euros um, and net exports uh, with 3 to 6 percent CO2 emissions could be reduced with 3 to 7 percent and uh, most importantly the use of raw material could be uh, decreased with up to 50 percent in certain sectors uh, which of course is really interest, uh, interesting also uh, from a food, food waste uh, perspective and the food sector, I think food production is one of the most important sectors where we could cooperate much more between Denmark and Turkey. And I think we should explore that, but also within textiles and, um, and specifically within uh, sustainable energy production like biogas, waste to energy. Uh, I know Istanbul is now building a huge waste to energy facility. And, and this is a kind, one of the elements in circular economy, which I think is really important. You know, how do you actually make sure that when you do waste, that you get something out of that? And, uh, and uh, looking at those opportunities uh, is, uh, is quite relevant. And I think we have a lot of interesting technologies in Denmark that could benefit the Turkish market. And we have a lot of, of knowledge on how to do circular economy business models uh, that we would very uh, much like to share with our Turkish uh, business stakeholders. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Annette, for these uh, 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 explanations. Um, we, are, we are having questions, but unfortunately we have limited time. Uh, maybe I will divert these questions after the sessions and we could be having contact with our uh, audience and uh, could uh, separately answer their questions. Uh, for today, uh, uh, we're of course suffering from extraordinary days for the last three months, uh, food sustainability, food security. These issues are crucial and I know that before uh, COVID-19, uh, all the um, participants, uh, distinguished panelists on the, which are on this panel uh, were discussing uh, these issues formerly regarding the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So uh, the COVID-19 just as being a catalyzer, catalyst uh, to make people uh, aware of that issues uh, and maybe uh, we have um, uh, so much um, limited time uh, to access uh, to that goals. But now since everybody, since every stakeholder, since every consumer, every grower, uh, in every part of every sector is aware, I think our full commitment to that issues will be much more efficient and will be developed uh, maybe uh, swifter than we have expected. So uh, thank you for all uh, participating and uh, to our uh, EU uh, talks, which will also uh, is a traditional EU talks after COVID-19 and will be continuing with more than 140 business council talks. And thanks for your presentations, thanks for your uh, contributions, and thanks for the answers to the questions. And see you next time uh, in the upcoming events uh, regarding uh, post COVID-19 era, uh, regarding on the food security and sustainability. And if for the final remarks, I would like to give each of you, Annette, uh, Aishin Hanım, Aichi Hanım and Umut Bey, uh, the last statements to the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much for the chance and uh, 
And uh, for the, I couldn't answer one question. I will write to uh, the lady uh, who asked the question separately. Thank you, Aishana. Aishana. Thank you very much for your organizations. Now we can understand that distance are not important. So we can come together. And uh, as, we, as we mentioned during the uh, presentation and also what they mentioned many, many times, being together will be really important for the next days, next years. And uh, we are ready for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aishan Hanım. Uh, Annette, anything to contribute on that? Um, well, just want to thank you again for organizing this. And uh, I look very much forward to uh, exploring future business opportunities with the Business Council, but all also with all the participants to this uh, webinar and I encourage everybody to send us uh, you know questions or comments or propositions for business cooperation our emails are on the website of the of the consulate and we would be more than happy to engage in dialogue on anything that has to do with the sustainable development goals uh, food safety uh, anything sustainable is what Denmark stands for so we look forward to uh, to continuing that cooperation thank you so much uh, thank you, Annette. And finally, Umut Bey. Well, I think not, not, nothing but just uh, thanks. And uh, just I want to conclude on all the messages that the, uh, you know, the other panelists uh, uh, given. Uh, so uh, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, our distinguished panelists. And thanks for the audience participation and keeping their uh, calm uh, till the end of the session, which means it, it was 100 minutes, one hour and 40 minutes. Thank you for all for this uh, uh, efficient and valuable webinar. Thank you. Good. Cheers, everyone. Have a nice day.